Hello, um, I'm back at home. Um, Storm Dennis is on, so I'm wearing a, uh, a, a coat to protect me from the water. Um, today I'm going to be doing a video on a couple of things. I'm going to be doing a, a video on the differences between regional accents and what that sort of entails. Um, and I'm going to be using that as a way of introducing IPA uh, to those who aren't very familiar with it. Now when I say IPA, I'm not talking about a naughty beverage, and I'm not talking about um, the international phonetic alphabet as in the sort of alpha, bravo sort of thing. I mean the, the international phonetic alphabet as in um, the alphabet used to sort of, you might have seen it in dictionaries, it used to sort of write out pronunciations. Um, the reason for the existence of the IPA, uh, the IPA is that um, Plenty of languages, most European languages, have a writing system, a sort of standard orthography. Um, so there is a correct way of spelling certain words, a sort of dictionary correct way of spelling certain words. Um, English's orthography is, it's not as bad as people say it is, but it can be quite difficult because of its inconsistency to predict the pronunciation of a word based on the spelling. So even if you know the rules of English spelling, um, you, if someone presents you with an unfamiliar word that they say is an English word, you can't necessarily work out how it would be pronounced just by reading it. Um, Spanish does a little better than English in sort of keeping uh, orthography and pronunciation tied together. So Spanish has a set of rules, and if you know the rules and you're presented with an unfamiliar Spanish word, theoretically you should be able to pronounce it right. Um, but that's still not perfect because that's only the rules of Spanish orthography. Every language with a writing system has its own orthographic rules and standards and um, patterns and things. Um, so how do linguists overcome that if they're comparing two separate languages or dialects? Or you know, we need it. We need something that that removes that um, subjectivity. Um, an IPA is an attempt to remove that subjectivity. So it's an alphabet that theoretically has a different character or a different way of representing every sound the human vocal tract is capable of producing. So in theory, someone that knows IPA, um, closed caption IPA, sort of narrow, uh, narrow transcription. Did I say closed caption? I meant narrow transcription IPA um, should... Uh, theoretically be able to write something down in a way that somebody else that knows IPA can read it out exactly as it should be pronounced you know with the regional accent and every subtlety you know um, now there are there are different ways of transcribing things in IPA it's not literally just a case of there's a character for every sound you can make because um, that ignores things like uh, phonology, sort of phonemes and things like that, uh, which are very important when, you know, when thinking about language, because you have the underlying phonemic structure of a language. Um, but it's, it's, it's better than just using the orthography of, uh, of the language in question. And it can be very helpful if you're, if you're trying to learn to imitate an accent to sort of know how IPA works. So it's, it's useful for a number of things. Um, what I'm going to do here is I've, I've got a load of voice recordings of people I know saying the same sentence um, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog now I know that's not got all the phonemes of English in it um, it's just a you know the only the only stories that actually have all the phonemes of English in are ridiculously long so I've just decided to go with the the one that has all the letters in and sort of use that to use that as a, a starting point but I'm going to compare the accents of the different people um, whose voices I have recorded is that my sister arriving? It, it does seem to be, so I'll just record hers now. First of all, the most important rule to remember is pronunciation has absolutely nothing, uh, nothing to do with spelling. Spelling might be designed to represent pronunciation, but they're completely different things. That's why if I want to name a sound, I'll say the T sound or the P sound rather than T or P, because uh, T and P are letters and letters are not sounds. Um, they're not inexorably tied to sounds. So I'm going to give IPA transcriptions here and try and focus on them rather than thinking about how a certain word might be spelled. First of all, um, myself, I'm from Surrey in the southeast of England. 
the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Then my sister, who, uh, who has almost exactly the same phonology. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Then my dad, who's from Cumbria um, and lived for a bit in Newcastle, and he's lived in the south for a long time. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And then my friend, who's from uh, Bradford. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The main differences between the southern accents that me and my sister have and the northerly accents that my dad and my friend have are in the vowels. When I say over, I pronounce it with what's called a diphthong. When I'm saying the vowel, the quality changes um, while I'm saying it. So by the quality, I mean sort of the, the actual sound of the vowel. So it goes from er uh, to oo, o, o. You can hear that over, over. So that's a diphthong where it changes while I'm saying it. When my dad and friends say it, they maintain the same vowel quality the whole time they're saying it. Or, or, over. Now here's one problem with IPA. Vowels exist on a spectrum, a little bit like colours. With colours you have red and orange, but there are infinite subtle shades in between them. And if I say this fruit is red, that doesn't provide you with enough information to imagine the exact, exact, exact colour. You can only imagine the sort of vague set of colours, um, the, the, the part of the, the colour spectrum that, that you describe using the word red. Likewise, if I transcribe a vowel using this character, it doesn't give you enough information to produce it absolutely spot on, because that character could represent anything from a small section of a spectrum. To a non-native speaker, it probably doesn't make much difference where in that IPA character the actual sound quality falls, but to a native speaker it does make a difference. My dad and my friend use slightly different vowel qualities, um, so you'd have, to add, you'd have to add extra diacritic markers to the characters in order to tell them apart. The same is true of the um, A vowel in lazy. Me and my sister use the A diphthong. A... A. But my dad and my friend both use monophthongs, although my dad's is more raised in the mouth than my friend's, the tongue, the tongue is slightly higher in the mouth. The two northern accents also don't have what's called the foot, strut, split. So in my accent, foot, good, put all have one vowel, but strut, nut, gut have a different vowel. It's the difference between u uh and a. Uh. In accents from the north of England, all of these words have the same vowel as each other. Something like o, oh, or oh, oh. The exact vowel quality a person uses might differ from place to place, but the point is northerners tend to have all these, uh, all these words in the same lexical set within their accent. That is, um, they're all pronounced with the same vowel. You can hear this in jumped. Something that separates my dad's pronunciation from my friend's is a thing called glottal reinforcement. Me, my sister, uh, and my friend, whenever we pronounce a voiceless plosive consonant, so p, t, k, at the end of a word, or if it comes before another consonant, we will put in a glottal stop, which means we suddenly close off the part of the vocal tract. Um, we close off a part of the vocal tract called the glottis, which means the sound beforehand stops suddenly. So I'll give an example. Without glottal reinforcement, stop. Stop. With glottal reinforcement, stop. 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 Broader Cumbrian accents and plenty of other accents um, don't tend to have uh, glottal reinforcement, but southern accents do, and that's spread into certain urban, uh, urban northern accents as well, particularly for younger speakers. Something you'll notice about all these accents when you look at the IPA transcriptions is that they lack any kind of r at the end of a word. This is what I mean when I say spelling influences how we think about phonology in an unhelpful way. The spelling of the word over has a letter r at the end uh, in, in English orthography and English spelling. But in none of the accents I've got here do you actually pronounce that r. I'm only doing it now r for emphasis. In my accent, you have three sounds in the word over. O, V, uh. None of these is er. 
It's the same for the others I've got here. From a phonetic point of view, these words don't have an R sound at the end. In all these accents, the word seeker, as in the species of deer, is pronounced identically to the word seeker, as in somebody who seeks. In some Irish accents, some West Country accents, um, Scottish accents, probably most US, uh, US accents, and some Northern English accents, um, you, you do pronounce the R at the end of a word. So these accents are rhotic. They all realise the R sound in different ways. And in the US and in parts of Ireland, you have what's called a retroflex R, which is, uh, I don't fully understand it, and I certainly don't know how to pronounce it. Um, on that note, I really need to talk more about US accents and get more into them, because they are fascinating. Um, but to get a bit more variety in, um, having said that about US accents, I'm now going to use non-US accents again. Uh, what about two accents that are probably even more far removed from each other? Uh, a not very broad accent from the sort of Midlands, Leicester sort of area, and a Glaswegian accent. Cheers. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The Leicester accent is is not that far removed from mine. Individual qualities are a tiny bit different, but they're close enough to mine to be represented with the same IPA character. The main difference is that he doesn't have the strut foot split, so he says um, jumped instead of jumped. Another difference between his recording and my recording, you might notice, is the vowel at the end of lazy is diphthongal in his case. E. E. Um, this is just because he's talking slowly and I'm talking quickly. If I say lazy in isolation, I would use a slight diphthong. E. To, you know, see, so the, I go from E to E. 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 Um, rather than staying the same the whole time. E. Um, rather than keeping the quality the same the whole time I'm pronouncing it. E. I say E. The Glaswegian accent is naturally very far removed from anything we've heard so far. The reasons for this uh, I'll explain elsewhere. Sort of historically the northern part of the UK has developed linguistically uh, very differently to the southern part of the UK. The short vowel in quick has a very different quality. It's pronounced with the tongue lower in the mouth, so the vocal tract is more open. Quack. The diphthong in brown is very different too. Um, brown. The quick brown fox. It also has an alveolar tap in place of the, um, the r sound in my accent, so it's era, era. It's like a rolled r, but it's only rolled once. Some vowels that are short in southern England are long in Scotland, so the vowel in uh, dog and fox becomes uh, fox, dog. I think this speaker uses a slight diphthong, so the vowel quality doesn't stay identical the whole way through. The Glaswegian speaker also provided a recording of himself speaking more broadly, as a speaker might do with their family or friends. The quick brown fox jumped air to lose the dog. Every language has accents and dialects and differences from place to place. Um, so here I've got an example from German uh, with the same speaker standard, uh, speaking in standard German and then in his regional accent from the Ruhr in western Germany. Nun sag doch mal, was gibt es Neues zu erzählen, Johann? Nun sag doch mal, was gibt es Neues zu erzählen, Johann? A lot of features of what's called the high German consonant shift didn't reach the rural dialect of the north and west, so that's why you have Zach, where standard German would have Zach. You have vat, where standard German would have was, and you have elision of bits and pieces at the ends of words, sometimes even inflections, so neu instead of neues. A third recording he did was in a separate language spoken in the same area, called Low German or Low Saxon. Taxonomically speaking, it's more closely related to Dutch than it is to German, but it's semi-mutually comprehensible to German speakers, particularly ones from the north. Nu sech doch maul, wat gibt dat neue to vertellen, Johann? You could say this is to German what very, very broad Scots is to English. So it's just uh, to show you that lots of regional variation exists in every language. Because it was even less hard hit by the High German consonant shift, Low German actually has a lot more in common with English than with standard, uh, than standard German does, phonologically speaking. 
So nu is cognate with now. Zech is cognate with say. Vat gift dat is cognate with what gives that. Um, tu is cognate with tu. And the tell in vertellen is cognate with tell in English. Nu zech doch maul. Vat gift dat neit to vertellen, Johan. Now say though, meal, what gives that new to foretell, Johan? doesn't really work when you translate it cognate for cognate, but you can see uh, you can take almost every word and present a still used English cognate. I provided the actual idiomatic translation for you there. IPA transcriptions can be broad or narrow. If the source you're looking at makes a distinction between these, it will normally put broad transcriptions in slashes and narrow transcriptions in square brackets. Broad transcriptions are more often than not phonemic transcriptions. They show you the sequence of phonemes a word is made up of. Uh, a phoneme is the smallest unit of speech within a language, so it's what a speaker of that language considers to be a single sound. A phone is the smallest unit of sound objectively, irrespective of language. A phoneme in a given language may consist of a range of phones. For example, in English, the sound represented by the letter p, uh, the letter p in spin is different from the P sound in pin. If you listen closely, you can hear that the sound in spin sounds a bit more like a B. That's because at the start of words, this phoneme is realised as an aspirated bilabial plosive. It's released with a burst of air. However, in other positions in a word, it's released unaspirated, without the burst of air. That's the difference you're hearing. Pin, spin. Pin, spin. These two sounds are different. In a narrow transcription, you'd mark that difference but we as English speakers consider them to be basically the same sound. For us, they're allophones of the same phoneme. So in a broad phonemic transcription, you wouldn't mark the difference between the two. But if I were to say bin or spin, that would sound a bit strange. So it is important to use the right ones in the right context, but then you do that naturally as a native, uh, native speaker. I'll come to you soon uh, with another video so thank you very much indeed for watching again I've met someone in the pub and said it'd be nice to have a conversation with them I've forgotten to ask their name um, there's an email address attached to the channel but in future I'll just swap contact details it's nice to know there are people scattered about with such a keen interest in this kind of thing but yes I'll be back soon thank you very much for watching